We have another Antonio Se guitar. This is the Vietnamese inlay magician. Look at the fingerboard on this. The entire body. There's no plastic in this. This is all the real deal. It's all abalone. And like that last one, this bridge also is going to need to be removed and re-glued. Luckily we caught that saddle before it tipped completely and split the bridge. So that will be addressed as well. Frets have to come out. It's almost the identical job to that last one. This is what happened. You get a spectacular guitar like this, but it, you know it's built in Vietnam, which is essentially like a tropical climate. And then it's shipped to Canada and it goes through a dozen winters. This needs a huge amount of correction at that neck to body junction. I'll be walking you through this step by step. Welcome back everyone. Mike McConville here one more time for String Tech, Stratford, Ontario, Canada. We have another Antonio Say guitar with spectacular inlay all over the body. I'll show you the back in a minute. But uh, we've got some problems again with this neck to body angle. Now because it is a Spanish heel, you can't remove the neck and reset it. It has to be taken out of the fingerboard and or the frets. To correct it, we need a bit of a balancing act between the fret we use and the amount of material that we take off the fingerboard. We've already lost some of this inlay up top and the way we're heading, we're going to lose quite a bit more of it in order to get this guitar to the point where it's completely playable. I have installed that 14th fret and this 4th fret. I have illustrated many times in past videos that those are my pilot frets. It's the 13th fret and the 4th fret. Now when I slide that straight edge up to the bridge, you got to remember this is with the strings laying flat on the frets. There isn't enough room to raise that action for the strings to clear the frets. So we've got several different options here and I'm going to cover them all with you and these decisions will be made. This is the saddle that was in there. And even with that saddle that high off the surface of the fingerboard, the strings still did not clear the frets. I don't know how well the camera's showing this, but that saddle slot is a bit rough too. I have decided to carefully remove that bridge, make a replacement bridge that is quite a bit thicker, and that will move us towards correcting this neck to body angle. I will continue to bring down this neck angle as much as we can, but we have to leave enough depth in the fingerboard to receive the frets. This bridge is definitely coming off and I will build a replacement bridge that will be a little bit thicker and I will glue the bridge on as I always do before I cut the slot. We'll do the measurements and then we'll slot the bridge for perfect intonation. In the spirit of saving this guitar from being an absolutely spectacular wall hanger to being a 100% playable beautiful instrument we did lose a lot of inlay up the top end, and I knew we would, but this is all in the spirit of making this an actual playable instrument. Something I'm doing here that I've never quite done this way before is this fret here is like a jumbo fret. This is a fairly tall fret, 51 thou high. This is a much lower fret. So I'm kind of building up the fingerboard with the fret crowns I'll probably come up to about the 8th fret or so and then I'm switching to a smaller fret for the rest of the way. You saw how high that straight edge was off the surface of the bridge. So I'm going to bring you back for another look. 
Now when I slip that straight edge up to the bridge, you can see that it's made a huge difference. I know we lost a pile of inlay to make this happen, but at least the guitar will be playable when we're done. Well, I'm pulling out all the stops on this fret job. So I wanted to bring you in before I go any further so I can kind of explain what I'm doing in our quest for a level fingerboard and a proper neck angle. I've used a combination of a smaller fret and a larger fret to further encourage the neck to body angle. I'm taking it out of the crown of the frets. This is the first of the smaller frets. I put a piece of scotch tape across there. This is the first of the larger frets, the very first fret, and I put a piece of masking tape across there. I've blended the height of the taller fret into the height of the smaller fret. Now the only exception to that is the last two frets where we still had a fair amount of fall off just because the neck had been set back so far. I put two larger frets in here so ultimately when we're done the straight edge from end to end will touch the first fret and the last fret and every fret in between. Luckily this guitar has a two-way truss rod so I have loaded and put negative pressure to bring this end of the neck up. hope you're following all this. Uh, it's going to make a lot more sense uh, as I get on the home stretch and you'll see just how much correction we did get by this out there method. There's nothing else you could do. As I mentioned, this is a Spanish heel. You'd have to disassemble the whole guitar to change the neck angle. It had to come out of the fingerboard. We lost a whole pile of inlay here, and that's just part of the game. Even if you pulled the fingerboard off, there wasn't enough material underneath to sort of reduce this proverbial hump at the neck to body junction. Okay, so I'm going to continue with this now. I'm going to take my piece of scotch tape off and I'll take this masking tape off and we'll start recrowning these bigger frets here. I took quite a bit off, increasingly more towards the small fret. I taped off that first one so I had the masking tape over this fret and I had the scotch tape over that fret. So I took increasingly more material off the larger frets to bring them down so that they would be level with these smaller frets. <laughs> I have to admit, I've never actually done it this way before, but I'm very happy with the results and I'll bring you in for a real close look when it's all done. So we're now on to recrowning. Got my trusty Hosco crowning files. Well, you can see the dry spots here, and at the beginning of the video, you'll remember me slipping a tooth out feeler gauge under there, and all of this area here was sort of dry. Now, the bridge came off super clean. We are going to make a new bridge using this bridge as the model. So we're going to come back and clean this up in a second, but right now, I will go to my radius disc sander conversion kit for the drill press, and then clean this up so I can use this as an accurate tracer plate to fabricate a new thicker bridge. We have a much thicker piece of ebony that we're going to use to create this new replacement bridge. Now, of course, I put some masking tape onto the ebony because it's 
pretty difficult to see a pencil line on that black ebony. I'll mark that all the way around and then cut it just shy of the line. Now the front I won't mark because I've left that a little bigger than it needs to be. Okay, so next step, we kind of line this up and tape that into place, both sides. and along the back across the front. Over to the drill press. I'm handling this very loosely because the drill bit is exactly the same diameter as the hole. So I want the bit to actually find its center. Two outside holes I am through drilling. Not quite through yet. Four center holes, I'm just spotting them. I'm now cutting shy of the line. I am now marking the location of the ramps.
Okay. Next, we're going to radius this foot back to the radius sander. So that is our perimeter, slightly oversized, that's what we want. So I'm back to the soundboard to clean up that footprint before I do my final fitting on this. We've got that 24 foot spherical radius on the base. We, just the two outside holes were drilled through. The other holes were just spotted. I'll explain that a little bit further as we uh, move along. So you can see we've got a little bit more on that perimeter all the way around. But again, before I do any more shaping on this new bridge, I'm going to clean up the footprint on the soundboard. Yeah, it's pretty craggy. So what I have here is a tongue compressor leather lined. And some 80 grit sandpaper to get the line share of this stuff off. We will use a much thinner bed of glue than what you see here on the replacement bridge. So the reason you want to use a tongue depressor instead of your finger is you tend to kind of dig a hole with your finger. As you can see I can flex it which really gives me some good downward pressure but, but it holds it flat. Now I'll switch to 120. 120.
And lastly, we have our 180 grit. The idea here is to get it to the point where the bed of glue is the same thickness as the finish. And this way we get 100% contact. Tomorrow morning I'll come back and calculate that bridge slot, slot the bridge, and make the saddle and compensated nut. So have a look at this angle now after all that correction. We are completely in the driver's seat, 100%. We can use any string, set the action anywhere Chris prefers, and intonate this thing within an inch of its life. So this is the new neck angle. So all of that hard work has paid off big time. Juggling the size of the frets, losing all of that inlay at the neck junction, nothing could be done about that. The most important thing is, now we've got a playable guitar. Before I carry on with the rest of the job, this is what we have now. And now let's have a look at what we started out with. Now when I slide that straight edge up to the bridge, you got to remember, this is with the strings laying flat on the frets. There isn't enough room to raise that action for the strings to clear the frets. To interpret this, this line here represents the theoretical distance. It's a 65 centimeter scale. So from the nut to that line is 65 centimeters. The compensated distance for the low E string is 65 times 0 0.097, which brings us to 6.3 millimeters, the distance from the theoretical line to the compensated line. And for the treble side compensation, 65 centimeters times 0 0.047, and that gives us 3.05 millimeters from the theoretical line to 
the compensated line. Now I do want to mention for anybody that's doing compensated nuts that line will end up representing the back edge of the saddle. So the saddle will go from that line forward. For anyone who's doing just regular guitars without a compensated nut this line will represent the center of the saddle. Let's make the cut. So this template is a CNC duplicate of the Bosch Colt router base. The indexing pin gives you the trajectory of the cut, the start of the cut, and the stop of the cut. So now we're ready to flick the switch. So before I pull this apart, I wanted to explain there's, there is a bunch of geometric considerations you need to take into account when you're doing this job. It's not just a matter of lining up the cut, but the plate itself needs to be absolutely perpendicular to the slot. And that's where these thickness hockey pucks go underneath that aluminum plate and hold that whole platform, the whole plate, completely perpendicular to the slot that we're cutting. Because of the nature of the rubber used in hockey pucks, there's zero compression, so it's not like your router is going to be springing up and down on this hockey puck. I mean, they mount big block engines on hockey pucks to stack them up and uh, raise up their trucks to go mudden. So that's not an issue at all. The other thing that's interesting is the traction for the hockey pucks is unbelievable. Like, I've never had this thing slip. It's only tightened by hand, finger tightened. Because the hockey pucks rest at the intersection of the kerfing, the top and the sides, that is the stiffest part of the acoustic guitar body. So you can put a fair amount of pressure without cracking anything, and certainly enough to stop it from slipping or moving while you make your cut. The other geometric consideration is, when you think about it, guitars generally, most of the time, are deeper at the lower bout and then taper towards the upper bout. So the reason this is designed the way it's designed is it allows this bracket to actually, it's loose enough for the bracket to slip and find that taper without disrupting the perpendicular nature of the plate. It comes in the box like this. You can literally take it out of the box. It's fully assembled. Set it on the guitar. Make your cut. So thanks to the way that Darcy packs these uh, bridge slotting jigs, you literally take them out of the box, set them on the guitar, and make your cut. Well, the moment of truth has arrived. This is our finished cantilevered compensated bridge saddle. These are the steps that we went through to make that happen. That is our compensated nut. These are 12 to 53 strings concert pitch and these are the steps that we went through to get that compensated nut to line up. And this is the action that we have now. I have to admit that going into this job in the beginning I really didn't know what we'd end up with, but now we have 100% playability, tons of adjustment on that saddle and the bridge. So Chris can use any strings he wants and he's good for years to come. This is the action on the treble side. I've been so caught up in just bringing this guitar back to life that I haven't even gotten around to showing you this inlay on the back. This is a great example of the Vietnamese inlay. They've been at this for like 1700 years. 
long before the Western world even knew what abalone inlay was. The Vietnamese had mastered it and there's still villages in North Vietnam that have been doing this work and continue to do it for the last 1700 years. The mitering and the execution of this inlay, the trim, it's nothing short of phenomenal. Yeah, wait till you hear this guitar. It's not just about looks. I am going to take care of this bubbling lacquer on the heel. Well, it's not perfect, but it's a lot better than it was. That bubbling lacquer was driving me up the wall. There we go. Well, I'm going to polish up this headstock. So this is 1200 grit. It must have been really humid when they sprayed this lacquer because it's, it's very cloudy. The whole guitar is actually quite cloudy, but I want to at least uh, polish up this headstock. I'm starting with this 1200 grit. Wow, that's already a lot better. It's 1500. 1800. 32, 36, 4,000, Six thousand. Eight thousand. Twelve thousand. This is 3M Final Finish. Still a very, very fine hand rub compound.
This is the third and final set of strings. That's how much room we have left on that bridge saddle. This guitar is good for many years to come. A final look at our replacement bridge and compensated cantilevered bone bridge saddle. This is for 12 to 53 at concert pitch. Let's go have a lesson. This guitar is a total package. I mean, the bass notes, the big throaty, listen to the A, open A, E, but it's not just bass. You listen to the top end,
You can hear all the sympathetic overtones. Middle strings. Top strings. So single line stuff, the bass response, treble response, mid-range, doesn't take long to figure out. Just strum a couple of chords. I'm going from a major triad, move up one fret to a minor triad, and a major triad, minor triad, moving chromatically, and then finally major triad. So those triads are played against the open B and E strings. So this opening chord is A minor 9. And then with this F introduced, it's a F major 7, sharp 11. But all of those dissonances sound so beautiful on this guitar. There's all these overtones. I shift up chromatically one fret, changing from major triad to a minor triad. So that's F sharp minor. Still droning those top two strings. Shift up again chromatically to G major. Shift up again to G sharp minor. And then shift up again to a major triad. So we're starting on A minor, ending on A major. Then I make my way back down.